Well, in general, each project is a different project. Unless you're, unless you're working on a product that is to be repeated, which of course I have. Uh, the first house, of course, was my first opportunity to do uh, uh, a house for myself. And uh, uh, it, it's a bit hard to appreciate that one could buy a block of land and build a house at, in that period um, when you're kind of uh, sort of employed as an architect. Uh, so it was a great sort of opportunity thing. Uh, but one of the things which was, uh, was happening was the Pettit and Severt experience, at, which started a year before I had the land, but I hadn't designed the house. So it was actually designed at the same time as the first Pettit and Severts. So there was a clear sort of um, um, recognition that one's one off and the others are not. Uh, so in a way, I think it helped the Pettit and Severts a lot because I didn't attempt to do things which were, let's say, elaborate um, in them. Uh, I could do it the direct, simple way. In the house, I could elaborate it. Uh, and by elaboration, I don't mean um, making it fussy and expensive. I mean, um, in fact, I called it on that house um, sort of theme and variations that you you set up a framework, which is like the, uh, like the rhythm of a musical piece and uh, the framework is re has got a, a repetition in it and um, quite complex but three-dimensional and then all the infills are different so every time it's got one of these triangular spaces filled in and uh, around every corner the infill is um, particular to what's being looked out through it or what appears to be from outside and what its role is or ventilation or uh, privacy or whatever. So uh, it's got a, a very um, elaborate uh, development of a theme in it, um, yet with very simple elements, uh, which means it still costs money. You know. uh, and it, of course, it takes a little while to finish everything off and get it right. So it was a big step and um, I was also designing the state office block at the same time and the Fisher Library was just being fitted out. So a lot of the um, detail that was being done in these high style buildings, high cost, you know, high quality buildings, um, could be assessed as to whether it was appropriate or whether it wasn't. So the, the Mossman House has the door furniture, bronze door furniture, which especially developed for, uh, for Fisher Library and the State Office. And it had um, lots of other bits and pieces, but it, it was kind of like a, a work, um, working out of things. Um, for example, the, uh, I knew the Raymore people and they were very keen because we were doing State Office Block. Uh, and they brought out, uh, it was Arthur Robinson, I think his name was, uh, brought out the T4 and the little sort of um, uh, dome-shaped uh, white cap on satin chrome mm -hmm. taps with a scoop out of the side. That was coming out. And the first production models were in the Mossman house. Where, you know, we were almost tested it there. Uh, and they finished up in Pettit Seven three or four years later when they, they were more common. Uh, and it had lots of other things like that occurring in it. It and had, had better than say, but cupboards, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so. And you had the lovely idea of the garden terrace as, mm. the, as the yeah. scene. Yeah, well, I, all, I think all the buildings I've done, I've um, um, either, I'm not sure whether you'd say, encountered or created or stumbled on uh, uh, the notion that there has to be a big idea. I, I think um, it, it's... It's not universal in art that there needs to be a big idea, but it certainly helps. And uh, it seemed to me to be something that um, was important. And I suppose um, what talent I had um, 
was for getting ideas. Mm. Uh, uh, and then, of course, the problem is implementing them, as any artist knows. <laughs> uh, so it had a big idea, and the big idea was that, uh, garden terraces. Um, the site was, um, was re relatively steep and triangular, and um, the contours ran diagonally on it. So it both stepped, and st stepped in plan and in section at the same time. And um, I suppose one of the other um, skills I got had was um, a sort of three-dimensional geometry understanding and understanding of the way things work around corners, which partly goes back to my interest in Mies van der Rohe. Uh, but, um, so, you know, that, that was a strong idea. Uh, to be, be very small. <laughs> um, yeah, it was uh, built in more difficult circumstances. Um, we stumbled on a block of land. Uh, I'd, I had lost the other house uh, in, to a sort of former phase of my life. And um, the, um, we found a block of land, which is unusual. Um, and the challenge then, a very interesting one, was to do a townhouse. And I had, uh, this of course was 1980, and I had um, been promoting initially th with Pet at the Seven and one of the other players from the Sunline Homes fallout, um, townhouse ideas, and I'd built um, several groups, uh, including three where um, our professional practice was a, 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 a part of the developing team we owned uh, the, the risk <laughs> uh, of building three groups of townhouses um, which were very successful one won an institute award and um, they were successful design wise but not financially and we all backed out of that at the point but they were patent seven things that was in 1960 six through uh, about 74. Um, so when I got an opportunity to do a townhouse, I was really interested in doing that that, that way. Um, and incidentally, the, the house um, at St Ives, the courtyard house that we've been looking at, uh, was also a prototype for townhouses for Pennant Seven. Of course, it, it's a a cluster house where you can join them together. Uh, so the big idea in Mossman was, uh, in uh, Paddington, if it was big, was that it would be built like um, a standard block of flats. Uh, it'd have concrete floors and brick walls and um, uh, just load bearing construction. So it, it doesn't have long spans and uh, you know big windows or any of that stuff. Um, it was an attempt to sort of use a kind of vernacular, what was then a kind of vernacular in building small uh, residential buildings. Um, and the other side of it was a kind of um, the notion of contextualism, um, the, the emergence of ideas about place and reference to um, reference to earlier periods and to the, con the existing context had been emerging for some years and I was something of a, a sort of um, uh, enthusiast for um, Robert Venturi's uh, work, not, not to do sim similar but to, to understand what it was about. And um, there was also some influence from uh, Alexander, Christopher Alexander, I think it is, um, who was talking about the, um, the language of uh, building. And um, so it drew the, the Paddington house, first of all, it was a six metre wide townhouse. Um, it had a unique configuration because of the slope and having to build right on the street and so on, but that's part of the game. But in terms of reference, it, um, it played a sort of um, street role 
about um, the um, security of space, the, you know, the hierarchy of public to semi-public to private, and um, the sort of barrier but from which you looked out and supervised the street and so on. And in devising that kind of screen wall uh, at the beginning, uh, penetrated by garage and by walk entrance and by a round uh, window. The round window came from the hotel on the corner of uh, uh, on, on uh, Glenmore Road at Five Ways. Um, and uh, looking at it from the other side, I, I was always interested in the vernacular of the back of terrace houses, with, particularly with their, the informal parts of them, the way the tunnel backs were done usually mono-pitched and with a big kitchen chimney, usually with um, just called out overhangs instead of the classic chimney on the ridge, which is a common, most common feature of terrace house. So I made the other side of the house look like the back of a terrace house in some ways. So tall and thin, uh, mono-pitched uh, and big chimney and slightly overscale chimney and so on. So it, um, it had a lot of those ideas about what I suppose people categorise as sort of postmodern views, but um, always been a contested uh, idea from my point of view. Uh, uh, nevertheless, it was of its time. The, the Palm Beach site was really a monster. It had been, uh, it had one creek running across it and another vigorous creek running down one side with a major waterfall. And um, it was in a slip area, and the part of the land in which you could build was very, very limited. And uh, fairly early in the piece, uh, I concluded it had to be a little tower rather than a, than a, than a long house. And uh, so it, it started small in plan and developed from there. Um, it, um, it, uh, it had a couple of um, strong ideas in it, I suppose. Um, uh, one was that um, to be in a sort of um, an evocation of the glassed-in veranda, the, the traditional glassed-in veranda that I'd spent, spent a lot of time in my childhood in to various relatives had them. Um, and, uh, uh, it, um, but what I, what I felt was interesting about glass in verandas is that you couldn't combine them with a balcony. Um, so I put the balcony beside the house instead and partly behind it um, rather than in front of the room. And uh, I think that was a fairly sort of um, uh, positive sort of move. Well, Palm Beach was was built in um, 1985, six that area, um, as a well as a house, both as a weekender and a potentially a kind of retirement house. Uh, and it turned out it wouldn't have been suitable for the kind of retirement I've had, which is busier than when I was practicing, but because there are more diverse activities. But um, that's that was the aim, uh, so it was very casual. But it was um, uh, it was it was arranged so that it had a kind of cellular rooms on the entrance level, the lowest level, which themselves were sort of perched up on a framework to get to deal with the slope, and they were enclosed with weatherboards, and they had this canite lining, and relatively small windows with shutters, and you could darken them, you could have an afternoon nap there, you know. Uh, and um, they were quite small room. Everything was small, um, and the bathroom was our bathroom was a bit like a, a bathroom on a yacht. And the other thing I used to do was race yachts in the seventies. Uh, another influence on me. <laughs> Mad, had activities. Um, it was like a yacht. It had a wood deck floor. You know, water goes through and tiny and. You know, um, and then the uh, the room, the room was the the top floor, which was glass all round, and um, it was a big glassed-in veranda with a high ceiling, 
and aloft as you remember, look down over it. And um, uh, it had a window seat right around and um, a table which I designed and um, alto chairs and uh, this sort of fairly simple kitchen. Uh, a lot of the cooking was done outside on a barbecue and under the sala, in the sala. The notion of the sala was a lot to do with my experience in the Southeast Asia. You know, I did the embassy in Bangkok in 1973 through 76 and um, got to love that kind of outdoor room with tropical foliage and things and Palm Beach did it again really, repeated it. Uh, lots of uh, air and um, shade and coolness when you wanted it. So um, that room was really what it was all about, uh, like on the top of it, and, then, yeah, and very much related, uh, related to the landscape, which is um, one of its merits is that you, the landscape itself was tangible. You know, there was a rock face there, you know, and trees and things. You weren't just perched up in the air with an ocean view, different sort of thing. So that, that makes it much more intimate and um, it deals with much more, a much wider amount of mood and, and uh, activity. So, and talking about Palm Beach, the the, the um, it's it's a rec if you treat it as weak, it's a recreational building to a degree. It's like living on a boat or in a tent. Uh, or in a hut somewhere. Uh, the best weekenders, I think, have that sort of character. Uh, and um, so there's a sort of game, uh, in a sense, um, the game of um, changing your rules about personal space and privacy, uh, yet still having places you can get away, but not the way that you lay a living house out where, you know, you try to zone it and not cross one to get to the other. Uh, so part of the game is uh, spatial variation and um, having a loft in which, which would overlook the main room given the room is very high and given the idea of the house being a staircase to get up the cliff, um, you then went up to the loft and the loft then opened onto a bridge which, opened, which led back onto the top of the cliff. Um, you know, there was a sort of game there that, that was, uh, uh, was worth ex exploiting. Um, and the joke we used to make was that um, uh, we figured that the grandchildren would, would live up there most of the time. But in fact, it was the, it was the children who uh, took over the loft most often and grandchildren were, were sent to the, to the little rooms down below. <laughs> The children by then being in their 40s, you know. Yeah, one, one uses the rock wall and the back wall of the house as a kind of courtyard um, with a beautiful lichen-covered wall uh, and where the sun comes in as well, so it's a little trap. Uh, and the other one's a sala, it's an outdoor room with a big roof and, you know, dining table and barbing and all that stuff. And, and then you can go up a couple of steps and, and another terrace which has a view, a big view, and uh, again sun, and it's got trees overhanging it, and it's, so there's three different characters. And when you count the, the room, um, the multi-use room, as another um, kind of living space, you've got sort of four choices of where you relax. Yeah. It's a, it's a puzzle, you know. I think puzzle solving is, is part of what architects do, I think. Uh, the question is assembling the, uh, assembling the questions uh, so that you don't have uh, distraction into the wrong sort of, wrong puzzle, you know. Uh, you've got to ask yourself the right question. Well, the house became a sort of staircase up the hill. It's actually quite difficult to get up to the high level. Um, and um, so you go into the house and you kind of wind your way up and back on the top of the hill. And uh, there's beautiful bushland up there. Uh, well, it wasn't when we started, but uh, 
uh, it grows back if you get to keep the weeds out. It was all lantana. Like when we bought the land, um, you couldn't fully inspect it because it was had three metre high lantana from the street to the back boundary. And um, we explored it with machetes. You know. <laughs> well, the Palm Beach House has the uh, a later version of the sort of canite wall linings that Harry Rimbert's had. Uh, uh, sort of, it's called low density. Well, when that was built, it was called low density fibre board. And uh, it's a bit like, um, oh, it's some, you know what it is. Like a bit corky, it's like It's a bit like cork. Yeah. Oh, it, it, it's fibrous. Yes. Uh, and it's golden coloured. It's wood chip coloured. It's basically wood chips compressed and mm -hmm. made to a deer. Uh, and it was used to be made from cane fibre years ago and known as canide. And it was made in Scandinavia and shipped around that way too in, in pre-war. And Harry's house used that. And also on the outside of Harry Rembert's house was uh, fence palings, which he used to buy at the local fence timber. And uh, in those days they were um, somewhat better quality than they are now, probably better quality than our select grade hardwood weatherboards. But um, you, you know, you could just buy it for dirt cheap. And, um, much of the building was done by Harry himself anyhow, and they were just lap, uh, lap vertically and nailed with governor's nail. And they're still there. I was, I was up there, Peter, Peter Weber owns it now. And uh, I was up there only three years ago, four years ago. Uh, no, I think, um, I, I'm always, I, I try to expose how it's made um, yes, first preference every, everywhere. Uh, in some cases you can't really do it with any economy or sense. And then the question is how do you, um, how do you place finishes so that they, you know they're finishes rather than something solid. Yeah. Um, the, the problem with all things, structure or finish, is that all you can see is the surface. And um, so the structure is only implied by its shape anyhow, uh, and some kind of lesson from the surface. Uh, but the Mossman House uh, is just as simple as the Palm Beach one. In fact, they've got a lot of similarities, um, including using bronze nails for the, for the boards and the um, you know, tallowwood boards, the Palm Beach's tallowwood boards, um, softwood frame, and, uh, and many aspects of the detailing. Well, um, I think one of the things that um, is appropriate in a weekender is um, is humour, you know, you know, light light heartedness, um, and uh, sort of visual jokes, almost um, recalling something and say, well, you know, that's like an old meat safe, isn't it? Ha ha, you know. Um, but in fact, uh, when you think about it, uh, of course, that helps you cement the idea to do it. Uh, the cupboards are left unused for weeks at a time and you need to ventilate them. So the, the perforated uh, brass fronts are actually quite sensible and even the open shelves, because even th they will of course collect some dust but um, you can at least see where everything is and uh, it's ventilated. So, you know, I think what tends to happen is you accumulate a a whole lot of sort of images and and um, things that you remember and like for some reason, and then they, they sort of come up. Um, you know that that stair is, in some respects, is not unlike the very steep stairs you find in a local Boursier, um two-story apartment. You know the split-level ones in in the Unité or or in some of his um, influenced people's like Atelier 5. Uh, these are very, you know, short, steep, getting up on it quickly into a loft. Um, and they just, they sort of come back and you remember that. You? Yeah, it's a much more confident house than, uh, than say, um, 
the Mosman House. Mosman House is a more original house in its context, probably. Um, but uh, the, the other one is, uh, has got the benefit of more of her life and, uh, and uh, judgment and so on. Well, the Mossman House was designed in, I suppose the design, strictly speaking, was 1961. Uh, and uh, it was built in 62 and, and won the 63, as it won the 62 award, uh, but it came out in 63. They were one year skipped at that point, uh, which is the same year that Fisher won the Sullivan. And uh, I was kind of thrust into uh, <laughs> undeserved prominence. Um, yes, so, uh, and it, you know, I'd had to save up for it and um, bought the land actually with the prize money uh, from the Cherry Brook, uh, from the, the, King, the, um, what was the Torman's House, you know, the Woman's Weekly Torman's House competition. Well, it was a huge prize. Yeah. Michael and I, of course, shared it and it was £2,000. Yes. Um, which is probably about forty or fifty thousand dollars in today's money. Right. Must be something like that. In nineteen fifty, it, it's more than ten times. Yes. Um, and of course, the land wasn't as expensive then. Yeah, it was. It was a huge boost, mm. and uh, I, I got the deposit on the land uh, and a car out of it, and Michael got. Uh, a car and uh, some some good living out of it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've always been involved in drawing, um, you know, right back to when you, you know, your parents like you to draw things for little gifts. My mother was something of an amateur artist and uh, quite, quite a fine um, Draftsman and, and watercolorist, and uh, encouraged me. And she sent me to the uh, to East Sydney Tech, uh, you know, the old jail uh, art school, uh, for schoolboy classes, which they ran in the, uh, during the late later years of the war and just after. And um, so I had some kind of formal training there, and then I went to the university. Uh, well, I tried to study art at school, but it was Sydney Boys High School and you could only do the curriculum subjects, um, which was all very well and they were very good, but um, you couldn't do art um, and you couldn't do any sport other than team sport, so neither of which suited me. So I then did a correspondence course towards the end of the school when I was too old for East Sydney. And, um, and Right. Then I got to university and of course that was the beginning of my life there. All the people we knew who um, had some connection with it and one of them knew Cobden Parks, the government architect, and sort of took me along and introduced me and he encouraged me to apply for a traineeship, which I got. It was of low prestige if you worked in the government when, when I was a university student. It was a, paying era. I was being paid for by traineeship. Peter Webber was the year ahead of me. Peter Hall was two years behind me. Um, and uh, so was Michael Dosa, two years behind me. So um, we all did this sort of traineeship thing. And the other students, of course, were paying fees and had nice things like motor cars, you know. But, but um, yeah, where, when um, when it became known that working in the government architect's office was actually quite good and we were being given inter really interesting work to do, it, it, then there was a queue for it and uh, it, it, it blossomed, it, the office itself blossomed from the demand that for doing the course. Won the Byra Hadley, which was the only travelling scholarship in those days. Um, which um, bought me a, a, a return ship fare uh, to Britain, Europe and um, a small amount left over 
So what with savings and working in London, for, I was away for 18 months on that, and toured Europe. It was a great time. Uh, um, Le Corbusier was building some of his greatest buildings. Ronchon was brand new when I saw it. Um, the uh, uh, the the uh, Jaul houses in Paris, I was shown through by the owners who were proud to have them. Um, see a student outside actually interested in their house. Uh, and we went to Finland and saw Alto's works, stayed in an Alto dorm and, you know, it was fantastic. Sainat Sala was just finished a couple of years before. Uh, and um, when I came back, um, my father um, uh, subsidised the return journey by flying me back through America. So I had sort of half my sea voyage, but could put it to the other. So um, I flew back through America and saw the latest Mies van der Rohe buildings. I, I went up onto the top scaffolds of the Seagram building when they were assembling the bronze cladding. Uh, in 1957. Sarin had just built the Kresge Auditorium and uh, you know it's the triangular one and uh, the Opera House competition just come out and uh, there was uh, Minori Yamasaki was a very influential architect there and Ed Edward Doral Stone and um, uh, Wright of course I went deliberately to see Wright buildings and uh, it was fantastic. Um, yeah, all those, those great people were still working. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yes, it, it, for that, so it was the end of my fourth year. Um, I had one of those sort of scholarship thing, prize or something. Uh, and um, I went to Melbourne and met uh, Neil Clarahan and he introduced me to uh, Bob Boyd and John Phyllis Murphy and Kevin Ball and so on. And uh, they were working on the Olympic swimming pool um, thing. That was 1953, early 54, 50, late 53. And um, they, you know, they all generously took us around the work and, uh, and so on. And Roy Crowns, of course, too. But um, they, I think that that period of modern architecture in Australia was at its best at that time in Melbourne. Um, Sydney was um, potentially going to be better, I think. Um, I think they were still, they were still philosophically, intellectually in a, a mainstream modernist era. Um, Sydney, you had, um, the arch exponent of mainstream modernism with Harry Seidler, who's building houses only at that point. Not many either, but one or two. Arthur Baldwinson, who was building the sort of classical modern house, and Anchor, who were again the same. So there wasn't a lot here that was significantly different to Melbourne or better, but there were some differences. Melbourne tended to be lighter, a little bit more structural expression, Sydney's tended to sit on the ground more firmly, except for Seidler, who did it, tend to float off the ground without wanting to rest on it. Um, so there, were, there was some quite interesting sort of um, student dialogue about uh, which way are things going. And uh, I didn't have to resolve that very much um, in that period, but uh, and the student work I was doing was um, was uh, because I was at the end of the course I was doing larger scale building designs. And that was all domestic. There was very little happening in large scale building here until the year that I, my last year and as I graduated, where the government actually got the chemistry school at Sydney University. And uh, I was in 21. And uh, Peter Weber and I designed it with Harry Rembert. And I, I think I got the first autonomous building that is totally responsible for uh, is the St. Margaret's Chapel in 1955. Yeah, 1955. Um, before I'd gone to Europe. 
and I detailed it by aerogram from Europe. It was being documented back here under Peter Hall's control uh, with my private firm and uh, uh, Harry Rembert and I exchanged aerograms um, you know, almost daily, <laughs> constant flow of blue paper going backwards and forwards. And, uh, it's a very good so it got a lot of things that I was already seeing in Europe, yes. um, like Matisse's Chapel at Vols and uh, uh, some of the alto influence that, that was coming. Uh, and also it, um, it was actually an expression of uh, my interest in structural expression. Um, that I was doing in the universe, in my university designs the last year and so, and it's exactly like some of the work I was doing at the university, the way it's structured, the expression. Yeah, it was sort of accidental, wasn't it? You know, when Michael and I won that competition, was just, you know, let's do the competition we won. We entered a lot of other competitions, didn't win them. Um, um, while we were in the government. Um, and, you know, it sort of just sat there. We got the money and sat there for a couple of years and then a state agent decided to, he'd like to build it at, uh, at Cherry Brook uh, and that got the attention of, uh, of uh, Lindley's. And um, Sunline, I'd, I was involved in Sunline because I knew Brian Pettit and uh, the Lend Lease guy and Max Bowen, and there's a long story. Uh, so somehow, in sort of in parallel, there was a the beginning of a sort of domestic practice was happening, um, without having sought it, uh, and um, it got to a dilemma at one point because suddenly Pettit and Sever took off in 1963, and. Um, uh, it was really uh, either I had to drop them or, or I had to set out while well, I got those two big awards and I was kind of sort of public and so I went into practice and basically on the strength of the patent seven, although once it was known I was offered the student union at Newcastle by the students because I'd done Fisher and um, and Bryce Mordlock then offered me a partnership, so I went straight into partnership, and in effect, uh, taking up Anchor's retirement. And uh, Bryce had all the work at Sydney University in the Darlington Precinct. And uh, so um, I, not entirely reluctantly, I mean, it's a total, total misrepresentation, I very enthusiastically uh, seized the moment of having um, become well known, having some awards and having the opportunity of a, an income from the Patent Seven and then from the practice of Anchor Mordlock, Murray and Woolley. Um, they were, um, what did they call them, upwardly mobile young professionals or something like that? Uh, is that the yeah, word? Yuppies? Yuppies. <laughs> young, upwardly mobile professionals, that's right. Uh, mostly. Um, not always. They were people who would have liked to get an architect design house and then either tried and it was too expensive or they could see that it wasn't going to work out and um, they, they came that way. Uh, there was also the emergence of the, of the product system that is project housing. It really didn't exist before about 55, 6, somewhere there. Well, not even then probably. Um, the Sunline effort was uh, from 1959, 60, 61. They went broke in 60, I think, 61. Um, and uh, Michael and I had actually done a couple of sketches for them. And their people all dispersed. One group became Patton Sebbett, another group became Land Lease Homes, and others went into other fields. Uh, so um, that's really the beginning of project housing and although Robin Boyd had done a little bit of it in Melbourne, it wasn't very much, it, it hadn't really been commercial. Uh, it wasn't until we'd established that Pennant Servant had 
established the uh, sort of architect design, good quality, very economical house thing market by about late 64, after I'd gone into practice, um, that uh, merchant builders set up in Melbourne with Robin Boyd's old client, uh, um, David Yenkin, who built the Black Dolphin Hotel you know, down the south coast. And uh, uh, Yenkin got uh, Graham Gunn and did those houses. The main thing that Melbourne had done very sensibly for a long time was the architect home service, you know, the, the age home service, which Neil Clarehan ran, which started by Robin Boyd. And Neil Clarehan ran that and did a lot of private houses of his own. And that's why I got him as our, because I knew him, uh, got him as our agent there when we expanded into Melbourne in 66, I think it was. 66, somewhere there, 67. Well, Pet and Sevet started off with really with uh, one design. After about a year, it was two designs. Um, after four years, there were probably fifteen, and, and you know we we're up into the twenties eventually. Um, and each of the models that were created originally uh, went through a product development phase, which we gave a alphabetic. Phase. We were up to I think H or I or J or somewhere. Uh, on some of the earlier models. Every year or every two years they got upgraded. Um, and partly for marketing reasons, there was also a rather a, uh, rather a stressful um, need to get another look out, another product that doesn't look like all of the others. You know. So you kind of work through all the little ed edges of the, of the thing, whereas the the, the big sort of main, most sensible, most logic house just kept going all the way through to, to product J. So of the three or four thousand houses we built, probably fifteen hundred of them were the low line in its various guises of different roofs and things. Um, but it also had a, so th there were a lot of models and we built a lot of houses. And there were spin-offs from it. Um, the Housing Commission got the firm then, uh, me and Sanka Mott and Murray and Wally, to do uh, uh, government housing. Uh, we built quite a few hundred. And in Canberra, um, I did a review in 1970, I think it was, of all the government housing in Canberra, detached housing, and then produced models in response to that. And we did prototypes, and Pettit and Seven actually built a lot of them and other builders. So the 600 houses in Canberra that were really uh, developments from patents ever into government housing at a, you know, at a pared down, you might say, uh, a pared down style. It was vulnerable to, um, like all products, to uh, copying at the same time as downgrading. Uh, so the combination of quality diminution, um, less aesthetic rigour, um, the assumption and correct assumption that some people wouldn't notice anyhow, um, so that there was there was a uh, kind of dilution of the market. Um, that didn't make patents have it still stayed at the top of the market, and there were a couple of others have it that, that Michael Tyson did and uh, uh, Civic that um, Melbourne architect um, Peter someone I've forgotten. Um, did uh, they were you know they were vigorous and good, but there were a lot of uh, other things. Uh, that's one thing. But the other one was the land ran out. The uh, the thing I've said all along about housing is that um, the house is only one of the factors. The locality is just as important, if not more. And the locality brings with it all sorts of issues like recreation facilities. Um, um, pleasant living, uh, social, um, social placement, uh, approval of your peers, schools, work, transport, all that stuff is part of housing. The house is just one element there. So if you take away some of those factors from the choice of people who otherwise might like your house, then you're not going to sell the house. So the land ran out at St Ives, it ran out at Castle Hill, uh, 
it was getting out towards Penrith. Um, in the south, it ran out once you got to the national park. Um, you know, in the northeast, we did a lot on the peninsula, but that uh, uh, ran out enough to mean that there, it, it just wasn't viable. And by then, of course, we were building all over Australia and we had franchises and uh, other things, and they tried franchising for a while. But um, Pettit and Sever, the people, um, had um, sold their interest to a public company which had other interests as well and went broke for the other interests, which meant that Pettit and Sever went broke. Um, I did a hundred houses in um, Fiji for, at a resort, which we, was were built, never got paid for them because the, when Pettit and Sevet went, the parent company went into liquidation here, they foreclosed in Fiji and just took them. So the. <laughs> uh, sorts of goings on. Yeah, all that's commercial life, isn't it? Right. Yeah. So but it was a fascinating thing to have done, and absolutely. I still find it interesting. And, and you know, you know, was middle. There were over four thousand houses built, yeah. and yeah. Um, as you said earlier, twenty variations on the, on the the styles and so forth. So it was yeah. a, a very valuable service. And, and with the um, the company revitalising, are they um, building and marketing again? Or? Well, in marketing, um, it's very very difficult. Uh, it's hard to say whether, hard to predict whether it. See, there, there, uh, we until we, built, we had the product and tried advertising and a lot of interest, but until you get down, down it didn't happen. And then um, one of the old uh, players of the early patent seven days, Dick Chadwick, um, funded a um, a prototype. So we built a prototype, which is invaluable, uh, and it. You know, we could re-establish whatever was appropriate of the look, which surprisingly was very similar to what it was before. When you went through the same process, it looked very much like it. Um, so in a way, it was a sort of unstylistic uh, exercise, which is good. Um, and it's a good builder who can build it. And, uh, and so on. But So then it was marketed, well, you know, we're ready and you can do it but several years have gone by and we still haven't got one going. Um, it's partly the land problem again. It's partly that the, the new land is, um, is being developed as what the Americans call tract housing. That is, the house and land go together or you have the option to buy the land and wait and then get the house. But you're really tied into the, the, that product. Um, Whereas the tradition in the 60s through to the 80s was that you bought your block of land, you paid it off, then you went along to the bank and you had your equity and the bank would lend you money and these, so with the insurance company. Now it's sort of lend you 100% without anything. Uh, so we're building a sort of uh, uh, American crash if we're not careful. Uh, so, so the patent seven is limited to people who actually have a block of land. Um, whether it's a knockdown or whatever, but they've got a habit, and that's quite a big chunk of it. Mm. And um, so far, and the other thing that's inhibiting is the bushfire regulations. The, a lot of the land that you can get with you, where you've got um, the choice of which house you build is caught up in uh, bushfire proximity. Um, the land that the developers are doing, house and land, is not, it's all old farming land with no trees. Uh, with very few trees, and uh, it's very difficult. Mm. You couldn't get land mm. with uh, w w th those sorts of people, the people yeah. with enough taste and money and yes. uh, incentive and where they want to educate their children and all the rest of it, were not able to get land uh, where we had had that. So they went into renovations and they started coming. That's why Paddington boomed again as a living place. and. Uh, the Federation style became uh, sort of rather overvalued and the bungalow style eventually, you know, everyone put uh, great big living rooms on the back of bungalow style houses. Well, um, as I said um, earlier, the um, uh, patents ever really went out of business by companies that had acquired them gradually winding down and out of loss of land, whatever, all that stuff. 
So it, it, that and the rest of the project housing market kind of disappeared for a long time um, uh, in favour of renovations. Uh, then it started to come back in the form of what we call Mac Mansions now, <laughs> uh, not for Pettit Simmons. So um, they'd all gone off into other things. Uh, um, Ron had passed away and uh, Brian had gone into other things. I used to do a lot of work with him after Pettit Simmons. And uh, uh, almost by chance in, I think it must have been about 2002, um, Val came across the fact that the Pettit and Sebert name had lapsed um, it, because it had been flicked on from as part of the assets of a whole chain of broke companies, most of them land developers and speculators of various kinds who took each other over. And the name was caught up in all that. And finally, that lapsed. And so she picked it up and um, came back to me, I think it was either in the late 90s or early 2000s, and said, uh, look, I've got the name back. And I know oh, uh, Al's a real dynamic. And, uh, um, you know, for the interests of their children, uh, and Brian didn't want to do it. He, he had fully retired by then. Um, so um, uh, she set out to do it, and uh, um, I uh, speculated the early ideas of how one might do it. We developed new designs and uh, developed some of the old designs, see how they work. And it, it, it sort of tended to drag on because essentially it wasn't really a business until it's a business, you know. And, uh, and then um, it got a bit of uh, impetus from uh, an opportunity to build a prototype uh, by Dick Chadwick, who was uh, used to be the roofer of the Pettit and Sebbets in 1963. <laughs> so that's how it, how it all started so up again. 